Welcome in to the Shop Management Show presented by AutoLeap. I'm your host, Will. This podcast will explore the experiences, challenges, and lessons learned of auto repair shop owners. We will cover every topic imaginable from EVs to technician shortages, right to repair, and so much more. Please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. AutoLeap provides an all-in-one cloud-based shop management software that helps shop owners better understand their business, increase efficiency, and grow revenue. You can find a link to schedule a demo with AutoLeap in the show notes of this episode. I'm thrilled to be joined by Steve Rodriguez, owner of Steve and Sons in Melbourne, Florida. We will dive into Steve's experience owning a shop and what it takes to run a thriving auto repair business. Steve, how are you? I'm doing good, bud. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me. I wanted to start our discussion today focused on your background, how you came into the auto repair business, and then the story of how Steve and Sons came to be. All right. Mine's not a normal way. I was uh, I, I was 26 years in, or 24 years in the military. Uh, when I retired, kind of got bored. It's kind of on the Auto Leap website. We went ahead and uh, me and a buddy of mine went to fix my sister's transmission. Uh, we didn't do a good job of it. I had zero mechanical experience. And according to him, he had a ton. So we messed it up. We bought it to a local auto, um, uh, transmission shop in Cocoa, Florida, who the gentleman there decided, you know, you know just let us know that, he loves YouTube mechanics and Google mechanics because that's how he makes his money. And then he said we had no business touching stuff and messing with cars, but he'll take the money block. Long story short, I just told him, I'm like, look, I'm retired. I got nothing else to do. I would love to learn how to be a mechanic. I'm going to come back tomorrow. You don't have to pay me or nothing. Two years later, he says, you're ready for your own shop. We kind of squished everything in there. So ever since then, I've, uh, I'm now a five-year mechanic, two-and-a-half-year shop owner is my history. Wow. That, that sounds like you were thrown into the fire right away. What was, what was the feeling of learning all of that stuff on the fly and quickly making that transition? It was tough because what I was doing for two years beforehand is I was just r and in transmission. So I thought I was a mechanic, literally. I don't know nothing about the inside of a transmission still. But I know how to change one. But when you open up a shop, this isn't a transmission shop. We've probably done maybe five transmissions since I've been open because I hate it. So we were, yes, definitely thrown right into the fire. Uh, bad, bad advice from, from salesmen and, 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 and people trying to get you to get their, their credit card machine, their software. You know, just had to learn the ropes the hard way. And where I came from, this gentleman, my old boss, who's like my mentor, doesn't buy tools. He uses like wood and crowbars to fix things. So I don't know how to do all that. So we had to literally, I was a YouTube freak for all, forever, Pro Demand, Mitchell, Auto Leap, anything I could get my hands on to get the knowledge, just because I don't believe in fake it till you make it, but I just never wanted my customer to know how little experience I had. None of them believed me. It's really interesting. Has that learner's mindset applied to your team at your shop? Was everyone eager to learn new skills? It sounds like that's been part of the shop culture. Yes, I have one mechanic now um, and myself. I started out with my daughter, who was like, I guess, the scheduler and service advisor all in one and about five or six customers. I've only had one mechanic the whole time. And then I have a 15 year old son that works here when he's not in school. So we all learn. We're all young mechanics. I think the one I hired was actually had more mechanical experience than I did because he went to uh, automotive school, but just didn't didn't have a job anywhere. So we're always, always learning from each other. So do you think it's possible, based on your experience, it's very possible to get into the auto repair industry and just learn on the fly, have hands-on experience? You don't necessarily need to go to an official school, or would you recommend taking that more traditional path if someone's interested in getting into auto repair? I can't knock it either way, but the more that my technician, when he first said he wanted to go back to school, one example I gave him was, where did you drop off in school? And he said, when I was, when I, before I come working here, we were learning about the inside of a transmission. I said, since you've been here, have you ever looked at the inside of a transmission? He's like, no. I was like, so what do you got to go to school for? Unless you want to learn the inside of a transmission. If you need that patch on your shoulder, go ahead. So I, I, I think that that would work. But 
it's not necessary. It's not necessary because I didn't. It doesn't, I'm not a, like a pro, but we, we got a good rating and we got a ton of customers and we have great, uh, great reviews. So not that what I'm doing is right, but it's working. Got it. Yeah. And I wanted to go back to kind of those early days starting the shop. You mentioned a few of the challenges in terms of, you know, the credit card issues. What were some more examples of those challenges that you faced early on with the shop and how did you overcome those? Well, the first one was probably not knowing what I was doing. Literally. Nobody knows when they came up here, they just see a new shop. So being a two-year mechanic and all I've ever done was take in and out transmissions every once in a while, a tune-up. These were codes and cars that I didn't know about. I got a ridiculously expensive scanner that does just as good as my cheap scanner. But that was one of the challenges in the beginning. They see a new shop, all these tool trucks come up, they establish, they give you credit. I jumped on it and then I stopped and I came up with a different mindset is if I got to buy a tool because I don't have any. The shop was only had a few tools. If I have to buy a tool, I would go to Harbor Freight. If I needed that tool a second time, I then went on to the truck. I made sure that the purchase of that tool got paid by a minimum of one to five customers. So I would have to know that I would use that tool enough to do that. Now we just got rid of all of our Harbor Freight. So now customers are actually buying our tools. So that, that was one thing. And then not knowing what I was doing was another. Again, with the credit card machines and, and, and bills coming in faster and I had to do the learning on the ropes and YouTube on a 50 inch screen turn towards the TV because somebody's already done this. Yeah, it's very interesting in terms of some of the challenges you just discussed. Do you have other examples of day to day issues that that come up that you've had to kind of learn on the fly and then grow as a shop owner and, you know, not have those things occur again? I think. Not taking on this is from a shop owner's perspective, not taking on the customer's personal problems to price your job is was my hardest thing to come over because I can afford because of my financial situation at home with the retired in the military. I can kind of afford to give a little leeway, but you give one little inch and it's not a mile. It's like a racetrack they take from you. So my thing was when I eventually learned it, be fair, fair. Nobody says my prices are cheap. They always say my prices are fair. So that was probably one of the one of the bigger things that I had to do. And the best part about being a shop owner, you pick your jobs. I'm the best oil change guy because that's all I like to take is oil changes, or that's all I like to take. So you get to kind of pick your job. You, customers hiring us, but we're hiring them too. Absolutely. Thought that's interesting what you said about pricing and then you know your customers. I'm assuming that means they know that they want to pay extra for that higher quality, that higher value in the service and report repairs that you provide. Is that kind of an accurate depiction of that, that they see the amazing job you're doing and they want to actually be able to pay more and have it be more of a partnership? You know, I don't see it that way because the first thing for me is they don't want to pay a lot. So they came here because the dealership was a lot. I don't lower my prices. I don't care what anybody else's prices are. If they say I got an estimate here, I don't want to know what it is. I'm just going to be fair and right to the point. So price point, they don't want to pay a lot, but I, I, just, I just can't budge because then it's unfair to other business owners that are not in the financial situation that I am. And then you become a bottom feeding snake. My first person that came in here was honestly Mitchell one and told me that you don't have a bathroom. So your, 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 your labor rate should be close to about $85 an hour. Well, I listened to her. That was ridiculous. That's less than what people that go to driveways and fix people's cars were. And I just, I was listening to sometimes the wrong people because you're a Mitchell rep. You're, you're important. You know how this goes. Well, let me replay that again. I'd kick it right back out the office and say, I don't want that program. Getting back to some of the lessons that you've learned over the years as a shop owner, how have you incorporated those different lessons into new operations, new best practices within the shop? And do you have specific examples of that? Say like a mistake or say something that, that came up that you overcame and how you applied that to the future to continue evolving your shop? I, I think the biggest thing is uh, transparency amongst everybody in the shop. Biggest thing I say when you come up, because I've only hired two people, and one of them lives with me, it's my son, so that don't really count. 
the biggest thing is just be honest inside here. If you break something, lose something, you misdiagnose something, there is not a thing we can't fix. We'll call a shot for a reason. And there's not a thing that you broke that hasn't been broken before. And chances are it's on YouTube. If we really had to dig and you don't, we can't get into those words. So transparency here is everything. If you learn something new, tell me if you figured out a different way to do something. I'm going to stop you and show you something I just learned on the scope. Not only that, but inside the office here with those two gentlemen that I have, which is my son and the guy, the, the, uh, my mechanic, who both of them ran this shop for a week while I was on a cruise. Transparency inside here. I let them see the numbers. I let them know what those numbers are. The reason why I need to let them know what those numbers are because they know where they are, which cog they are in the wheel of this vehicle moving forward. They have to know their importance. And yes, you just did an oil change, but that oil change sold us something else. And this is the big picture. If you don't let your tech see the big picture, then they're a paycheck to paycheck guy. I want you to want to run a shop someday. So I want you to have the insights here. Both of those guys, they see my bank account until I start getting a bigger bank account. I need you to know why I eat last and you eat first. And at the same time, nobody knows our struggles in here because if you look at our ratings and our reviews, they think we've been doing this for 20, 30 years. So that's a big theme is internal communication among your team. How do you guys work that into like a day-to-day cadence? Do you have regular meetings, regular check-ins? How is that a part of the culture at the shop? We haven't gotten that official yet because we are a two-man shop. We try to get out between eight to 10 cars a week. Now, mind you, two-man shop. I set up the estimates. He does all the work. So my mechanic fixes 10 cars a week. They'll range from an engine swap to something as small as an oil change. We normally just don't do oil changes. But with that aspect and with some of the auto leap leap stuff uh, when it comes to scheduling and stuff like that, we we're not too strict on, I just give them time frames. I talk to the customer. I, 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 I tend to be charismatic, I guess, with the customers and, and, and can kind of talk them into keeping a car here a little bit longer, something like that. It's in their best interest. We're doing another couple of steps or something like that. But the transparency does it all. And giving a time limit, we're not a dealership where you just marry to that car. You can take the blades off of one car, waiting for the blades while you're charging the battery on another car while you're pulling something on another car. One technician's got to do all that. So the owner has got to make sure that technician is fed. They buy, buy them lunch. Got to make sure they have water. Got to make sure they have all the tools that are available. Because at the end of the day, both of us are working as a team to get that car out in better shape than it came in for a fair price. And if it takes us longer, That's not the customer's fault. So we got to eat it. So neither one of us want to do more work than we're not getting paid for. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a really thoughtful system you guys have in place. Do you have examples of ways that other shops would be kind of best practices to avoid in terms of not being transparent? What would a shop that doesn't have proper communication look like? What are some of the issues that would cause? Being in the military, we kind of learn that where you have team leadership and all that. You kind of learn that at the end of your career is a little bit higher in rank where you're kind of in charge of teams and creating teams and stuff like that. So I just brought that here and I would want to know everything. I just make sure if I was a tech, what, what I would want to know, what I need to know. And for, I just don't want somebody to come in here and just be clock watching. Or worried about how long the job is going to be. Worried about how much money they're going to have. Definitely worried about it. It's got to be in your mind, but that can't be number one. Number one has got to be here. The customer is first. Not right. The customer is first. And their job is first. It's before our lunch. It's before we go home. It's before we come in in the morning. Customers first. They don't need to know what's going on back here. They just need to know that we bought their car in, we sent it out, and we're fair. No, that makes a ton of sense. You definitely answered the question. That kind of brings me to my next point of your approach to customer service. It seems like that's a really important thing to you. Like, how do you think about that as a shop owner? How do you lay that out? And how do you continue to refine that so you're giving the best service possible to your customers? One thing that I do, and I think other shops that don't do it as crazy, is once the customer calls me right then and there, it is my job to get that car here. Not in two weeks, not because we're busy, not next week, not in three days, because when I say that I'm busy, you're going to go to somebody else. That person just hired you as a customer. I want every single customer to come here. At that point, you get some shop owners like, well, how much money can I get out of this customer on this job? 
My question kind of off the record is, how long can I keep getting money from this customer? Because I offer fair prices and I do good work. I'm, we talk. I, I, I know about your kid that just got out of the, out of the Navy, um, Navy uh, boot camp. You know, I'm personable because I because I'm a, I'm a nice guy, too. I'm not that stressed here because of my other financial situation that I have to sell a job. I'll be the first one to tell somebody man, I'm not taking that money because the value of the job is more than the value of the car. They respect that. So I want every single customer. I don't make anybody wait. Now, once they're here, I put my effort and, and, and talking them into it. I may keep the car here for a month. They're fine with that. But. If I told them that I can't see you for a month, I'll never see them again. I need the ability to hire or fire you. I don't want you to have that ability. You can have the ability to hire me, but if I don't take the chance and say, come on in right now, I mean, if somebody called me, like, yeah, I got plenty of time, even though I'm in a podcast, I'm not letting that customer go somewhere else unless I want him. Absolutely. So it sounds like being genuine, number one, and then number two, making them feel like an immediate priority and actually having them be a priority. Would that be an accurate depiction of that? Honesty, integrity, don't lie, cheat or steal is the things I live by. The biggest reason why I don't lie is because I can't remember a lot. It's a lot easier to tell the truth. Your car is like not good. You didn't do this, you didn't do that or, or whatever, or we messed up and so I have to have the car next day. I'll buy the part. We did something or something along those lines. I think customers appreciate that, especially if I'm not trying to stick it to them for something we did, which is usually maybe a misdiagnosis. We don't have too many of those times that I've had to figure out a way to make up for a mistake. And I wanted to ask you just some general advice in terms of if you were talking to another shop owner, what would you recommend if you had three recommendations to provide to another shop owner based on your experience, your lessons learned? Could you think of three recommendations that you would provide for them just as a general advice? Absolutely. Get you a software that gives you numbers. I'm still learning what numbers, but every report I print out and I like colors and pie charts and stuff. I like arrows going up and arrows going down. I don't want to do all that other stuff. Every morning I see what I made the day before, the week before, the month before, this week, last year, this week, two years ago. Get an all-inclusive software. And in my case, I have a software that includes Pro Demand. For my text, if they just one click of a button while in it, all my numbers I need, the ability to order, it's just an all-in-one that you just sit here, do what you do, and then you go over there and just get your hands dirty. So that would be number one, is just something to get you on track and keep you on track. Uh, I can't think of too many others besides just, if I was talking to somebody, is if you need this to make your mortgage at home, don't do it my way, because I came into it with no savings and no experience. Got it. Yeah. Having a foundation before you even enter into uh, being a shop owner is very important. Having a plan. You got to have a plan. You just want to open up a shop. That's just not the way it goes. I got lucky because the building was here. Lifts were here. There was some tools here, but you, you need to have a good plan. I don't think we had more than a hundred customers for probably about eight, nine months. So your plan is going to have to include marketing. Auto leak does that. That's pretty much it. Just an overall plan on how you how you're gonna get it done. Cause being a good mechanic don't mean you're gonna be a good good uh a good shop owner. Cause I think I'm a good shop owner. I'm not sure I'm really a good mechanic. I know how to fix things, but that doesn't make you a mechanic. And how do you separate? It's interesting you just drew that parallel. How do you separate being a shop owner from being a mechanic? Because there are two very different things, obviously. And you, I, I think from like a high level, you would need to focus on the business and its growth. So how do you kind of separate those two things and make them coexist? Honestly, I'm a mechanic throughout the day and I'm a business owner when I go home and I can go through the numbers and all this stuff only because of the customer and the car count we have. I want to make sure we stay at this pace or faster. And when I see that it's sustained long enough, it's time to bring somebody in now because now I will 100% double the profits. I step back, do my thing from the beach because Auto Leap is web based, and then my money makes itself. You pay your people good and you make sure they're taken care of. You let them know how important they are. I'll all the time say, Look, we made this much money off of this, and look what you did. Look how you learned that. You're mad because it took you nine hours in a 14 hour job. Now you did a 14 hour job and you're 23 years old. Now, who else is doing that stuff? Everybody else is on PlayStations and stuff, almost.
That's awesome. I, I just pick it up a lot from you that you you love to empower your team, which is I think super important, and I think it resonates with how well your shop has done. Are there any other like empowerment strategies that you you implement as a shop owner that you would want to cover that you think are maybe unique to your shop or maybe could apply to other shops as well? I think you find out if your people are content with just making money and staying in the same spot. A raise is not really a raise. Do you want to run something? If you want to, I don't want anybody to work for me for 50 years. I think that would be great because I have somebody, but I want somebody who wants a little bit better because now you just see the clock watching or waiting for that raise. I want you to, that. that's what gets you involved. That's what gets you over your other guy's shoulder to make sure he's okay because between the two of them, they have to get this job out because I'm doing something else. So it, it, it's got to be teamwork. It, it's got to be teamwork. It's got to let your people know the value that they bring to the table because they bring way more value than I do. I'm not even a money front man. We're just kind of shuffling money from customers to next car, you know. So their value, without them, I'm not me. There is no way I can keep this pace. In the beginning, yes. But when we have 800 customers in two years, there's, there's no way I could do this by myself. I let them know that. And I let them know how valuable every turn of the wrench is for them. And then I pay them extremely well. We go flat rate. I'm not doing the hourly stuff. We're doing flat rate. You touch a car and, and you're getting paid 10 hours for and you get it done in two. You made eight hours. Let's go get another car. Because not only did you make eight hours, you made 25%. I made 75%. And all I did was tell you what to do. I printed something out that says this. So for every dollar you're making, I'm making three times as much. So I need to show you how important that is, or else I'm not making it three times as much. And I don't really, it's not about the money right now. Right now, it's for my kids to take over as I suck in every single customer I can in the state of Florida. Then the money will come. Money's going to come. With every customer, money comes. It's the, it's the greedy people that want all that money first time. So you may have to give a couple of hours away. You may have to give some parts away. If you can notice in their eye that they're, they're, they're kind of questioning something, look, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to let you say something back. Look, I'll tell you what, this is what we're going to do. I think it was us. We're going to throw in a free oil change and I'm going to take 20% off that Like That's what a business owner does. Business owner's job is not to turn the wrenches, but it's to keep customers coming through the doors. Because without customers, I'm just a sign on the door waiting for cars. That's really good perspective. A lot of interesting stuff there. I know you mentioned the transition to your, your kids taking over. How are you planning for that now? And like, what would the steps be for that? Like, what's, what's your approach to that in general? All right, Steven's son, Steve from Steven's sons has 10 kids, two hands, has 10 kids, eight boys, two girls. Of them, my nine-year-old comes here regularly on Saturdays. My 16-year-old has worked in here as a service advisor. Or no, my 16-year-old is actually a mechanic. He's out there and he does everything. Great, great kid. My 17-year-old, Played Porter, did the, uh, the, 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 the oil change stuff and, and, and stuff like that. Then I have an 18-year-old. I don't know all the ages. But the 18, I have another kid that came here, and he was uh, in the office doing a service advisor. Not that they didn't work out. I would never want to force somebody to do something if they don't want to do it. Because you need to love what you're doing here. Because this, this, this shit ain't easy. It's hot. We get yelled at. It just you're dirty, you're sweaty. So it's not easy. So I need you to like what you're doing here. But to me, if something happened tomorrow, my 16 year old's a mechanic, I got a service advisor, I got a porter. They all know what their role would be. If mom says, Hey, y'all need to go and keep this thing going. Steve did all this. That's my goal. The money, like I said, will come. I, I'm not if I was here for the money, I, I definitely wouldn't be greasy. I'd be charging a lot more. So at any time, my kids could come right back in because they look, worked here long enough in certain positions that three of my kids can run the shop. I have a service advisor. I got a porter. I got a mechanic. That's all you got to do. The service advisor just got to learn the pace, learn how to schedule. I'm bad at that because I want everybody to come today. I think that's a great place to uh, leave it. Thank you for joining me very much, Steve. And we'll be back soon with the next episode of Shop Management Show presented by AutoLeap.